Hello and welcome to another episode of Zelf on the Shelf. I'm Tanner. I'm Sam. Tanner, when was the last time you went on the Mormon subreddit? I don't know that I've ever been on the Mormon subreddit. Maybe like once or something in like 2015 or something. <laughs> I felt like when we were g- right at the end of our faith crisis slash right at the beginning of like the exit phase we would see stuff about the Mormon subreddit a lot because I feel like the Exmo subreddit was always talking about it. it. Yeah blowing up but to just like go cruise around get in conversation. You didn't used to do that? I don't think so. (laughs) It was grim. I remember when I first left the church I would always try and like start shit on there you know just trying to get them to doubt their faith I guess but they were uh, they had good noses for it they could smell it a mile off and they did not tolerate it and I think I got banned from the subreddit I'm not sure where's that t-shirt banned from the Mormon subreddit I mean the ex-Mormon subreddit as we know I feel like this has been written about in like pretty major news publications the ex-Mormon subreddit is quite a big deal has a lot of members for a subreddit, for such a niche religion. Mm. This morning, I woke up and I took a deep dive into the Mormon subreddit for the first time in probably five or six years. And I saved some stuff I felt that we should talk through today, so. Is this slash LDS or slash Mormon? It is slash LDS, yeah, sorry. Are you ready, first post? Let's go. This post is called Struggling With Garments. Background to help my post make sense. I have been a member all my life. I received my endowment which is the Mormon like super special ceremony that you go and do when you go on a mission or get married generally, right? You're like roughly 19 years old when it happens. Uh, I received my endowment 16 years ago and I've always been a fully active and temple attending member. In the last few years, I've had physical and mental health struggles and much of it has led to weight gain and then a total hysterectomy six months ago, which pushed me into early menopause at a young age. I've never had a big problem with garments until my surgery six months ago. Garments, just in case anyone is watching who doesn't know, is the magic Mormon underwear. (laughs) Ever since then, I'm incredibly uncomfortable when I wear my garments. They are too hot. I get rashes, UTIs, and sweat through multiple pairs in a day. I recently started wearing only my garment tops with regular panties. I hate that word. It's hard to (laughs) say out loud. (laughs) as my bottoms and I've noticed a huge change in my mental and physical health. Hate that this isn't the first time I've heard that garments give women UTIs. Mm. I'm no longer sweating as much and my feminine health is balanced and much better. I wasn't feeling resentful toward my garments as a result of this change because that would probably get you kicked off the cell right? Oh yeah. <laughs> but I began feeling intense guilt and shame. Yeah, just always channel your resentment into guilt and shame. I started feeling intense guilt and shame about not wearing them, especially. I'm the problem, it's me. <laughs> yep. Especially after the area authority talk recently about casual wearing of garments. I saw a few things on the Mormon subreddit about this. It seems like the leaders of the church are worried at how little people are wearing their garments and they're making a bit of a push for them right now. Nothing comes which, between you and the LDS church. Remember that. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. If you can get people to wear your religion's special underwear, even when it's uncomfortable, you've got a pretty good <laughs> grasp. Whole grasp on them, you know. It's a, it's a winning cult strategy to get people to do stuff like that. So I decided to try buying new ones that fit better and are a different fabric to help with sweating and moisture control. It did not go well. I had a complete breakdown at Deseret Book. At least the tears were coming as I practically ran to my car and now I'm home and can't stop crying. Finding them in my size for my waist and length and that won't make me sweat to death is impossible. I'm five foot 10 and all legs. I found some in my waist size, but when I tried them on, they went three inches past my knees. That was the regular fit. Also, s- such a racket that um, not only do they have to wear the underwear, but you have to buy them <clears> from the sole, uh, yep. f- sole distributor, the LDS church. <laughs> it's got to be some uh, apostle's nephew who owns the company mm. that manufactures the thing that's bringing them. That's how it always goes. They had one pair of petite that were too small around the waist and low cut instead of natural waist, and the petites were still too long on my gut waste also the girl helping me said so anyway she just goes into like the struggles she had with finding the ones she wants then she said i'm not trying to wear modest clothes i never even wear shorts (laughs) i started thinking about cutting my garments to the proper length of just above the kneecap and sewing the mark on in the right place but then i started having a panic attack thinking about getting in trouble for altering them oh (laughs) you're trying so hard to make this 
cult tactic work and to the point where you're even like you're going to extreme lengths you're thinking of cutting them sewing on the thing yourself you're already going to the bookstore you're trying a bunch of different pairs it's not like you can try them on for fit in the changing room you have to buy them before you can try them on mm -hmm. and you're having a panic attack thinking about getting in trouble for ordering them when you're trying so hard I'm now even considering returning what I bought and just buying men's garments I hate how upset this is making me I'm not trying to be rebellious. I just think it's sad how much she's reiterating throughout her post that she's not trying to be rebellious. She's always been a member. She really believes. Is she the, wants to wear them. I'm genuinely curious about the comment section because if oh, I... Oh, we'll get there. My experience in LDS, especially anonymous LDS discourse, is they tend to not take very kindly to yeah. this kind of... And let's just say they're not about to just jump in with the, uh, you shouldn't feel shame. It's, oh, it no. sounds like you're trying really hard. It's like That's if anything, not what we're going to get. Just you're not feeling really enough shame. Yeah. <laughs> no, just you wait. Um, I have been faithful my entire life and this past six months of health challenges and my experience of trying to accommodate those challenges makes me not want to wear them at all. And then I cry more because I feel so guilty about that. My garments aren't helping me feel the spirit. They aren't helping me remember my covenants. They just make me sad, depressed, and angry. I don't know what to do. Oh, someone is fuming reading that. BYU grad Brad Hinckley is so pissed right now. <laughs> so first comment of advice. Hello there. I'm sorry you're going through a hard time. Physical changes with the body are so hard on one's mental health and my heart goes out to you. As a female who is 5'9", overweight, and has lived in hot climates, I have a few things I do to keep the heat at bay. Number one, I switch from women's garment bottoms to men's mesh garment bottoms when exercising. You can just cross-dress garments? Yes. Does Suddenly, gender, gender mean nothing to you? gender is an eternal divine thing. Okay. <laughs> They happen to be more, br also, as if garments couldn't get any more hideous than wearing men's mesh garments. Well, <laughs> they happen to be more breezy for me, and doctrinally speaking, I don't believe it's against the rules to wear men's garments if you're a woman. But please feel free to correct me. <laughs> it's like, don't kick me off the sub. <laughs> Two, I find cotton garments to be better. I'll also try and avoid jeans or pants. No big deal, just avoid wearing jeans or pants. You can wear your religion super special magic underwear. And then three, sometimes I get a size up for my shirts. A lot of detail about that. Four, sometimes I take two showers a day instead of one, especially if I'm doing strenuous work. This has helped me not have to change garments throughout the day and kind of resets my body temperature. It doesn't even have to be a full long shower, just a quick, win quick rinse with cold water is very helpful. <laughs> with, yeah, with cold water, uh, which we learned last episode is a great anti-masturbation uh, strategy. Mm. Really cold, really fast shower. <laughs> this is definitely giving that because it's like, Oh yeah, just take two showers a day. That will just fit in with anyone's schedule. No big deal. Or, do you know what I mean? It's I like clearly mind. there's a lot of issues here. With you know, she's getting yeast infections and like it's bad on her mental and physical health. She's having panic attacks. Like I feel like the first port of call in any comment here, if it's going to be healthy, needs to be like, "Hey girl, so sorry you've been having panic attacks. Doesn't sound like there's anything you should feel ashamed of here or like anything to feel guilt about. It sounds like you're trying really, really hard. Have you considered restructuring your entire appearance and <laughs> lifestyle to I accommodate? Know. And then after those tips, this person says, just to make sure, God, just to make sure. We have been instructed to wear the garments both day and evening as much as we can, but sometimes bodies are weird or unhelpful. Making and keeping covenants are a special sacred honor we have between Heavenly Father and oneself. I'm like, who are you saying this for? Clearly the person in the post is like fully on board with garments <laughs> and feels like shit about themselves, but you feel they need to just get on your little high horse after your tips just in case you were too friendly. I truly believe that if you make this a matter of prayer with your Heavenly Father, you and he will come up with a solution because God's always giving solutions for UTIs. Don't give up hope, you're doing your best. Can I just, this is a tangent, but remember when Under the Banner of Heaven came out and a bunch of members were really upset at how often the Mormon character said Heavenly Father? Like, we don't talk like that. Like, yeah, you do. <laughs> what do you mean? I didn't even know that was the thing they got upset about. Yeah. I mean, the whole, if you make this a matter of prayer with your Heavenly Father, you'll come up with a solution, basically sets the stage for having panic attacks, because you basically believe that if this isn't working for you, you're not being righteous enough, and like God's maybe cursing you with UTIs, because you know, if That's you have the mindset that like God will help you wear, if you're supposed to wear garments, then God will make it work for you, and you mm -hmm. just cannot make it work for you, what are you supposed to think? You're not allowed to place blame externally. As she said, she doesn't feel resentment, she just feels intense guilt and shame. And then the first response to that comment was, this is a perfect response to finding ways to keep your covenants rather than finding a way to be an edge case. I just kind of feel like if you're getting constant UTIs and your mental and physical health is being affected and like nothing is working for you, 
We need to talk about the fact that men are the ones who sign off on garments, right? Which is just kind of fucked up because this is not the first time we've heard women in the church talk about how the garments give them UTIs. And it just feels like if a woman was designing, that wouldn't be happening. Yeah. And surely there's a better way. But it's almost like all part of it, you know? The more you sacrifice for your religion, the more converted you become. So they're sort of all right with it. I just want to go back to the day when it was to the ankles and to the wrists. One single mm-hmm. piece with a hole in the hole bottom in the for peeing no and mess, sex. No fuss. Any final thoughts on the garments? No, just sad, sad, just sad. kind of a bummer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next post. Marrying outside the church? Question mark. What is the church's stance on marrying outside of it? I understand the temple ceiling part, but other than that, what is the stance? For context, I'm a member who's thinking about progressing a relationship towards marriage with an absolutely wonderful man who I think is pretty much perfect for me. I can already guess the responses. It's like, is it an interracial marriage? Because <laughs> if if so, the church actually still uh, advises against that. So, <laughs> Oh, contraire, Tanner, it does not have to be an interracial marriage for people to be <laughs> shitty to you on the Mormon subreddit, but we will get to that. I worry about the religious consequences of marrying outside the church, as marrying inside the church is the norm where I live. At the end of the day, I feel a little bit guilty about dating her, and I'm getting tired of feeling guilty. Big theme on the Mormon subreddit. Guilt. Guilt. (laughs) Especially about a relationship that is such a healthy one. Thoughts, advice, prayers are all appreciated. So I just want to point out that this guy said he's in a wonderful, healthy relationship with an absolutely wonderful woman who is pretty much perfect for him. Pretty ringing endorsement. Sounds like a good time. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) What could go wrong? (laughs) What could go wrong? First comment. This isn't about what is normal for where you live. This is about being sealed for eternity to a spouse so you can be exalted together. These will help you understand it better. And then it's just a link to like the church website that's like uh, eternal marriage, but just the most basic patronizing responses that I'm sure this person already knows. I love about why temple ceiling's important. It's a pretty standard uh, LDS practice of to like counter any kind of question or doubt with just all the same stuff that's always been mm-hmm. said that everyone is familiar with and presenting it like it's the first time that anyone's ever heard it's it. It's kind of just like a passive aggressive patronizing response, isn't it? Because in Mormonism everything can always just go back to, you know, the gospel is as simple as a child, so simple a child can understand it, except we don't tell them about all the other stuff or whatever. So it's like People will be asking these questions who clearly have all the same, like, conditioning you have and know all, this, you know, know all the same basic stuff. And then to just leave a link to, like, the eternal family section of the LDS website, like, that's going to be brand new. Just feels a little bit like, clearly there's something you haven't understood, you know? Mm. It has that energy. Next comment. There is an old Jewish proverb. The fish and the bird may fall in love, but where do they build their home? There is much to consider. How will you address things like which church the kids go to, tithing, garments if you're endowed, and in general, the fact the church demands more of your time than most other religions? How will you treat each other's beliefs? Will you both be constantly trying to convert each other? My favorite one uh, uh, is when a Latter-day Saints have to project their proselytization paradigm onto everyone else. Because, mm-hmm. you know, they're, all their social interactions, every relationship with a non-member is filtered through this programming that they've received that they need to convert that person. Mm-hmm. So they're in all their fears that they're projecting in the world is that other people are trying to make them like them. And it's like, actually, people don't care. Like, that's not how the rest of the world operates. It's like what you see with the... So much of the anti-gay rhetoric and stuff is like, they're trying to destroy us and seduce our children. Blah, 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 blah. And it's like, could you, it's so hard for them to imagine that some people just like want to be treated nicely and fairly mm-hmm. and aren't trying to turn you gay or convert you to. Because other people's ideologies don't hinge on the <laughs> a belief that they are superior. So they don't feel the need to convert you to their way of thinking. <laughs> Like, it's my own only thing, people that believe that their way of thinking and believing and doing things and living is the, the superior way. That and the only way, not impulse. even just yeah. like better in some ways. It's like the only way. Yeah, every other way is invalid and you honestly don't even deserve empathy. If you, yeah. Um, well, don't worry, Tanex. We've got a voice of reason coming into the comments next. Can't wait. I mean, you kind of glossed over the temple ceiling as if it's no big deal. That literally dictates and impacts your eternal exaltation. That's a pretty big consideration you may want to think on and take into account. That was so the most popular bestie. comment. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's the helpful advice. No one no one came in and was like, sounds like a great relationship. Sounds like you should make it work. No. Nope. Don't, Don't marry, do it. Don't marry outside the church. 
another post. This one, I don't know what to make of this one, so I'm curious to get your take on it. Forgiveness advice, question mark, is the title. Hello, <laughs> I've come here to ask for forgiveness advice. During the first couple of years of our relationship, when we were dating, my husband was incredibly emotionally cruel to me. He cheated on me and then got angry when I became paranoid and self-conscious. He put his friend's feelings above mine, got angry with me when I did any little thing wrong. All of this had a massive effect on me. I'm not the same person I used to be and it's not a good thing. He has very much learned from his mistakes over the years and he's a good man now. He's earned my forgiveness. I just don't know how to give it. I thought I'd healed, but then we moved hours away from family and friends and now I have to actually face what I've been through and process it. The other night, these negative feelings came to a head and I exploded on him. In that moment, I felt it was his fault I'm so broken and he needed to deal with it. It was awful of me. He's done everything to earn my trust and forgiveness back and I can't seem to let it go. Please, if anyone has any advice on how I can forgive how he treated me back then and let it go, I'd love to hear it. If your advice is to leave him, I'm not going to do that, so please keep that to yourself. Yeah, it, uh, even if he has changed in some ways, it obviously seems like things aren't resolved and that it hasn't pro properly been processed or dealt with, which yeah. would be an important part of his change <clears throat> process. If that is sincere, that needs to be thoroughly dealt with and examined. Mm -hmm. And even if he has changed some behaviors, I, I don't, is he taking yeah. full accountability? Is it like, I really struggle to believe that's anything's possible, right? People can change, but it sounds like, you dated someone for a couple of years who was, as you describe it, incredibly emotionally cruel to me. So I'm like, did you, did you marry him during the period of cruelty or did you kind of just like have a couple months before marriage where like things were better and so then it, and then you were married after so it just kind of all felt better to you and he wasn't going to cheat anymore because you were married. But uh, I don't know. I just, I'm curious how he how he got to be a good man now. Cause I feel like incredibly emotionally cruel is quite an intense, I'd say it's very rare for someone to go from being incredibly emotionally cruel to like a great, wonderful partner. Mm -hmm. I mean, never say never. And then I'm also curious because if they tolerated like utmost emotional cruelty, then what's their what bar? bad behavior yeah. right now is being passed as good. Right. If this has been your standard here and now they're here and right. a neutral person is here. Because a couple here. of years is not an insignificant amount of time to date someone who is incredibly cruel to you. Like mm. that's a long time. So it feels like the, a root issue. There's something behind that, you know, like outside, you know, she's talking about how she feels like she's so broken and it's, it's all his fault or that's how she at least felt in the moment the other night but it's like it sounds like the problem is goes way further back if you're willing to date someone like that for a couple of years also she and said the other night snap? yeah exactly these negative feelings came to a head and I exploded on him and what made it come to a head I'm curious about that also seems like a red flag that I thought I'd healed but then we moved hours away from family and friends and now I have to actually face what I've been through okay you've been in a, you were in a relationship with someone who was abusive for multiple years and now you say he's changed, but you're also isolated from your family and friends and you feel like you're being left to just deal with it all on your own. None of it sounds good to me. It's really hard to believe that he's done everything to earn my trust and forgiveness back and I can't seem to let it go. And just the fact that she's feeling so bad about herself for not being able to forgive. It's like, what did you get? Couples counseling? Like what level of resolution did you get or was he just like well we're married now so I'll stop cheating and like mm -hmm. I, I won't put my friends first anymore but that doesn't necessarily change like all the emotional damage or so I was obviously curious to see what the Mormons in the subreddit had to say about this first comment says I'm probably not the best one to give advice but have you spoken to him about it also whenever I'm struggling about things like that I only turn to the savior he knows how to help you he knows what's needed for you to forgive pray and ask for help and guidance. And then someone in the comments said, how do you turn to the savior? And they said everything like reading scriptures, praying, church, trusting in him is turning to the savior. They act as one, the church and the savior. So when you do the things we're supposed to do, we're turning to the savior. I think trusting is the biggest part that most struggle with. I have a hard time with this because, you know, it's saying like turn to church leaders, turn to the scriptures. And I don't feel like they're a wealth of good information for women about how to deal with abusive relationships with men in that there's barely any women in the scriptures and when they are, they're usually belittled. Turning to male church leaders 
could definitely lead you to stuff that's like, you know, victims need to take responsibility for abuse. And in general, I just feel like the patriarchy isn't super equipped to help her navigate this. And that's why she's so focused on the forgiveness part. But it's like, is that the biggest issue? I mean, maybe. We can't, like, we can't speak to someone else's situation, but it seems like there might be things that are not just forgiveness that need to be dealt with here. Right. Uh, it's easy to think about things like just being like, oh, I forgive you. And then that not changing the feeling because the things that are causing the feeling still exist, mm -hmm. even though I've intellectualized mm -hmm. this conflict away by saying, like, ah, atonement, grace, forgiveness. Like, and she's obviously still strug still in pain in this relationship. And I also think if, if you spent a couple of years with him while he was being cruel and now you are moved now you're hours away from family and friends, it sounds like there's a very high chance that your thinking could be distorted by whatever he's feeding you. Because if he was able to be cruel to you for years, then he obviously had some kind of power over you. So it sounds like he maybe still does. And this is a patriarchal religion, so, you know. Another person's advice was counseling with your bishop, your untrained bishop, would be helpful to start. And <laughs> Your local plumber will do a great job. Uh... <laughs> Just thought that was kind of disturbing that the first uh, piece of advice they have was to go to your bishop. Again, someone who's not trained to deal with this stuff. And he may be able to refer you to a professional counselor that shares your beliefs. Also, we've talked about this before, but like the whole thing in patriarchal systems is just that men's experiences are centered. And so there's a high chance that the bishop is gonna empathize more with the man in the situation and be like, you just need to cling to the savior. If you go to the temple more, if you do more, if you sacrifice Submit to more, your husband. <laughs> yeah, like either to the husband or to this organize, you know, none of it is actually useful stuff for healing. It's just gonna be like double down in the church more and then that will make it go away. And then when it inevitably doesn't go away, she'll keep feeling more guilt and shame, which will keep her trapped in the spiral. And that's how Mormonism works. I love the emphasis on of counselors who share your beliefs. Because yeah. so far, working within a system of everyone who shares your beliefs is not producing positive results. Yeah, because you've married someone who was emotionally cruel to you for years and you're in pain because of that and you're feeling like shit about yourself. Maybe a little outside perspective might help this time around. People just want to like exhaust, I guess, every, every realm of possibility within their current way of thinking before they're willing to venture outside. Usually if people are in enough pain for enough time and the pain becomes truly intolerable, they will start seeking more alternate views but a lot of people are just very slow to allow themselves to consider them because it's too scary so they're like even though I've done this thing you know like marry a man who was cruel to me for two years which probably most non-LDS therapists and maybe even LDS therapists would have been like is that a good idea just gonna go with it I guess okay so we got another post about garments Apparently, Elder Kevin W. Pearson, president of the Utah Area Presidency in Utah, gave a broadcast. My brother, who was very devout during his mission and prior and after, was visited by Kevin W. Pearson. And any time his name was mentioned, again, as a strong believer, my brother would just be like, I hate that man. He's so mean. Oh, really? Yeah, he was just such a dick. Well, I think it's... Interesting that we're about to hear uh, Kevin shaming people for not wearing their garments after we've just read what that woman went through to try and wear her garments. And I, I do feel like it's a lot easier for men to wear garments than women because it's not as different from the kind of underwear men would wear anyway. Mm -hmm. But it is a lot different for women. And of the Mormons I know who are maybe like, on, don't wear their garments that much, they're women. It's mm. usually like a women's issue. I refuse to be lectured by anyone named Kevin. <laughs> this is just a quote from that talk that the sub is really vibing with. The terms and conditions of God's covenants are not negotiable and honoring them is not optional. That's what they used to say about changing the garment anyway from the neck high wrist. Yeah, and now we've got little <laughs> tight Karenesses. So even though he doesn't tolerate it, sometimes he does. We are dismayed by the casual and even cavalier way some treat their temple covenants, including the casual and inconsistent wearing of the temple garment. I would argue that male religious leaders being cavalier about how many women are getting UTIs with their religion authorized, demanded underwear, I can't speak today. Um, is much more disturbing. You know, he's making a good point. Joseph Smith wasn't wearing his garments when he was in Carthage jail, and look what happened to him. His Jupiter talisman, he didn't protect him, but maybe his garments could have if only he had stayed faithful to his covenants. There is among some a growing sense of spiritual apathy and sporadic covenant keeping that is becoming increasingly common among those who should know and do better. 
Covenant keeping has nothing to do with personal preference or convenience and everything to do with commitment. Again, you can see why that other poster was feeling intense shame and guilt <laughs> for not being able to make the garments work. Because this is saying it doesn't doesn't matter if you have an ET- UTI. That's not what it's about. <laughs> if that, that's your what God wants for you to overcome. We are confident that if these sacred covenants were better understood, they would be honored and cherished above all other commitments. Top comment. I'll be honest. I don't fully get garments, along with much of the temple ceremonies. Sometimes garments are inconvenient or less comfortable, especially in the heat, but I wear them because I love God and covenanted to do so. I remember a talk by a stake president who basically said, we don't have to want to keep all the commandments, we just have to be willing, and the desire, the want, will come later. That's how brainwashing works. (laughs) That is how it works. Do things that don't make sense to you, that are disagreeable, and... Wire your brain for the thing to be familiar. Someone replied to that comment and said... I love your comments. So true. Garments in the temple ceremonies are mostly symbolic. Symbolic. I love how the temple is so symbolic and everything is symbolic. But if you try to suggest that evolution is real, they're like, but what about Adam and Eve? Mm-hmm. It says very clearly. In my opinion, it's vital to have an understanding of the symbolism. Again, this feels like a common thing. Just members symbolism shaming like it's like you must not have understood the symbolism and this I feel abstract like a lot of time, concept that's not thoroughly explained i know it's like i feel like most people do it's just not enough like every religion has symbolism every like ideology has their symbols and their myths and their stories and that doesn't necessarily help you when you have a uti it helps me stay focused and appreciate the beauty of the doctrine how simple it truly is mormons love that line of like how simple it all truly is <laughs> even really though it's like so it's many simple. secret ceremonies Marrying teenage girls. So simple. So simple. <laughs> Understanding what the markings on the garment represent. No, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Understanding the Masonic symbols on the garment will help you understand why you can't take it off, even in the case of a <laughs> UTI. Was it more difficult for Christ to suffer or for Heavenly Father to witness it? <laughs> 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 and then people in the comments are like, for Jesus, not even close. Like, they're just all <laughs> arguing. Like, it's just such a... It's like people who are obsessed with Marvel, the way that they all talk. When you zoom out and think about it, it's like, who hurt worse? The person who was and experienced every kind of pain, or their father who, who made them, them do to that. Do it when he could have come up with any other plan, presumably. It's like, no, he had to. That was the only way. People will be like, God is like the top of everything, right? He's mm-hmm. like the 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 greatest power, the most all-knowing force in the universe. But it also seems like you believe that the idea that someone must be or something must be sacrificed is like a Thing that transcends like <laughs> actual God Himself. It's like you. It's not because otherwise God could come up with a million other ways that didn't mm. demand that. But it's like you think, well, it's just like a law of the universe that something has to be sacrificed. That that's what they believe. They believe mm-hmm. that Elohim was a person very not too not too different than us, who merely obeyed the laws of the universe until he was able to evolve to a certain point where he could uh, make his son be tortured for all of mm-hmm. us. Um, I love that meme going around that's like, if so, if a god is offering to save you from the punishment you will receive if you don't allow them to save you, mm-hmm. that's not saving you. That's extortion. It's so hard for, for religious people to see that. It's like, mm-hmm. do a little name substitution, mm-hmm. change out god for Kevin, <laughs> and if it seems like Kevin is an absolute psychopath when you're not thinking about it in terms of Heavenly Father and just some person... Maybe that's not a god you want to worship. Mm. Maybe worshiping a god like that doesn't set you up for success in the relationship realm. Because god is incredibly emotionally cruel and physically and in all other ways. <laughs> Repent or else. <laughs> wow, you're so wow, I love my savior. I choose willingly to go. <laughs> the, the language of the day is just to be like, I love god so much, so I do all these things. And it's like, yeah, but you also believe that you'll be like punished if you don't do it. So, I mean... <laughs> It's kind of like you just have to say you love them so much so you don't get punished, which I is would... abusive. That's why you have to see Mormon therapists only. <laughs> this one's just a little meme. It says, it, well, it's a quote from Silence Souls Weeping by Jane Johnson. And the quote is, depression is a disease, not a spiritual deficit. And I just thought there's a little bit of unpacking we could do there because um, Number one, that is an advancement of the narrative. Like, I think in the past, the church absolutely taught that if you were depressed, it was a spiritual deficit. Like, that idea didn't come from nowhere. There's a reason you're now having to rebuke it. 
And how could it not be seen that way if you're teaching that your, your church membership is literally the only way to experience true happiness so much so that your whole schema is entitled the plan of happiness mm-hmm. and to feel so depressed Men are while the adhering joy, to that. Consider the happy and blessed state of those who keep the commandments. Yeah, I also always find it interesting when people phrase, like when people label depression a disease because we now know that there's like, 11 different core reasons why people might experience depression. It's not really as simple as just saying it's a disease, mm. you know, like, it's not something serotonin- you like cough and it's like, well, I'm depressed now too. Yeah. And it, you know, it tends to run in families because of intergenerational trauma and like there's potentially a genetic component sometimes, but like depression is like a normal part of the human experience that can reach clinical levels for all kinds of reasons, such as like being in abusive dynamics with organizations that constantly teach you to doubt your doubt yourself and to experience shame yourself. for minor normal things. Yeah, like depression is like a big part of depression is just like disconnection from the self and like from the world around you and sort of and I feel like the guilt and shame that is perpetuated by LDS teachings doesn't help that. Oh. So I just think it's in, it's it's convenient for them to I mean because again they used to say that if you were depressed you know it's your own deal and you need to turn to the atonement more but it's also convenient for them now to be like it's a disease you know because it's like it's a lot more complex than that there's a lot of factors that go into it mm-hmm. and I, again I just feel like the the way that Mormonism puts you in on like a specific path that you're not allowed to deviate from is very likely to create depression because. Mm-hmm a lot of people get put on a path and sold a fairy tale that doesn't live up to their expectations and that they would not have gone down had they not been sold it as that fairy tale. And so then, of course, you're going to be depressed. Depression can't be removed from the circumstances that are created. Yeah, exactly. Apparently, this has been a big year for the serotonin myth being debunked. Just heard it from Andrew Huberman from Hubie Hubes. Just just thinking about (laughs) Daddy Hube. Yeah, Daddy (laughs) Hube. If you don't listen to Andrew Huberman, he just did a great episode on happiness that I quite enjoyed. Speaking of Andrew Huberman, he defines uh, addiction as. Actually, I don't know if it's him or Gabor Mate uh, who talks about addiction as something that uh, seeks to become our only source of pleasure. Mm. Um, So. And then Huberman would, of course, talk about how that works with our dopamine Uh and how that thing is constantly spiking our dopamine, making us more dependent on it, and then cutting us off from the things that would balance out our dopamogenetic... You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And how that is literally the tactic of the LDS church. They don't, like, can't have coffee, can't have tea, can't have this, can't do that, can't enjoy this, can't... You know, they want to be the sole source Mm -hmm. of dopamine reward that a person experiences. And the nature of dopamine is that you you get used to that same amount. And so you have to seek more and more. How do you seek more and more? You become more and more scrupulous. You Mm -hmm. know, you beat yourself up more and more. You, you, You always hear religious people be like, the more spiritual you get the more guilt you feel. Like we saw that in our evangelical uh-huh. Christian video. Cause it's like, cause the spirit tells you more of the ways that you're offending God or whatever. Mm. And it's and like, no, you just have to seek a bigger and bigger hit because you're not <laughs> going to get the same hit that you used to get uh-huh. from reading scriptures. And we were talking about this earlier, how even negative stimulus can be an, mm-hmm. a, a mm-hmm. sort of addictive cycle, totally. um, which shame plays into mm-hmm. anyway. Yeah, being addicted to nervous system regula- dysregulation, such a real thing. But I'm glad they're not teaching that it's a spiritual deficit anymore, so that's something. That is a uh, step forward. But it's almost like this new narrative allows them, a lot of people to sort of stay complacent about the ways that the, the way their life is set up and the, you know, the way that they treat... Because Mormonism invades your brain. Like, it is dictating how you should think, how you should view yourself like it, it people, robs you of, the yeah around you. teaches you that you're sort of inherently sinful you can't trust yourself your sexuality is something you need to be ashamed of rather than something to be while the outside world is perpetually scheming about how to throw you in a prison camp for mm-hmm. believing in Jesus and mm-hmm. they're trying to usurp uh, all your values and again seduce your children and overturn your families mm. and don't don't read anything that would contradict these views and don't mm. research these things that could give you an expansive view of how the world operates just mm-hmm. go back to the scriptures go back to the church listen to them I experienced so much dis- depression and anxiety in the church and I still experience those things those are just like states that I ebb and flow in and out of 
But it was way worse yeah. in the church. Because there was no real way out back then. It wasn't, no. There was no tool that we had to get out of it. So it was realistically, most of the time, the brain just rebalances itself after a few days of, you know, mm. going crazy. But it's like when your solution is just pray, read scriptures, like you sometimes, it's like a lot of the time your brain will produce the narrative you need. Like, ah, a scripture about God loves me. Mm. I can feel relief. I'm allowed to feel relief. Your psyche knows what it needs and it mm. can find it. But But not for everyone, because some people are more prone to, like, scrupulosity and just, like, much more harmful ways of viewing the gospel and how it should be incorporated in their life. Even, I just had, like, a baseline anxiety in the church. Like, nowadays, sometimes I'll experience anxiety. When I finally left the church, it felt like there was, like, rope this thick tied in the tightest knot that had just been pulled for you know 25 years and when i finally was able to just be like i don't have to try to like this doesn't make sense i don't have to believe this i don't have to adhere to that it was like that knot came undone and i didn't even know it was there Mm. i was just so used to the feeling of constant like clenching of my body and you're like 25 right until you realized that it was even like and then that went away and i was like whoa has that been in me how long has that been in me And I just wasn't even aware of it. That's scary. Very scary. And so relieving to not have that. Mm. Yeah. And I was talking recently with... I I mean, that's so many people's experience leaving the church. Mm. Well. Yeah. It's it's not good to just constantly be... Like, trying to trying to make up some perceived deficit that you like this is saying like depression is a disease not a spiritual deficit but like they're constantly teaching you that other stuff is a spiritual deficit and i feel like believing that all the time could also make you depressed so (laughs) functionally how useful is that message i don't know so the title of this post is garbage life pro tip on front page meaning on the front page of reddit be careful to keep your beliefs and your identity separate otherwise changing your opinion becomes as hard as changing your identity Ding, ding, ding. I well know. said. <laughs> but it's so funny because this person is positioning it as a garbage take and everyone in the comments is like, it's a garbage take. Mm-hmm. So let me finish the post. They said, um, otherwise every belief about anything will go down the same path as religion. Changing your mind will become one with changing your identity, something that many people find incredibly difficult. And then the person says, obviously the first few top comments are from those who are no longer members. And then they quote a person who's ex-Mormon saying, I grew up Mormon and leaving, it was very, very hard once I discovered it wasn't true. The core of my identity was that I was Mormon. It's easier to leave the group when they shift away from the values you hold if your identity is the values themselves and not the group or label. It's also easier to identify when a group is going against your values when you're not so dedicated to belonging because it's your identity. And then someone else said, as a former Mormon, this tip hit especially hard. Um, And then the person said, this reminds me of the spiritual insight provided by Bishop Glenn L. Pace in 1989. Wasn't there some kind of scandal or weird thing with him? I can't remember. Can't remember. Um, The quote is, you can leave the church, but you can't leave it alone. The basic reason for this is simple. Once someone has received a witness of the spirit and accepted it, he leaves neutral ground. One loses his testimony only by listening to the promptings of the evil one, and Satan's goal is not complete when a person leaves the church. When he comes out in open rebellion against it, God, it's like just a simple life tip on the front page of Reddit. Just like, don't cling to your beliefs too hard because we can all be wrong. We're all human beings. People throughout history have thought that their thing was the truest thing on the face of the earth. And just someone showing a bit of intellectual humility and encouraging others to do the same. And then everyone's just like, you just can't leave it alone because you've been listening to the promptings of Satan. Extremely Mm -hmm. normal. Curious. Interesting. I noticed that when people discover their houses are are on fire, keep coming back to get others out. They just cannot leave it alone. Also quotes another thing from Glenn. Inappropriate intellectualism sometimes (laughs) leads one to testify. (laughs) You're being so inappropriate with your intellectualism (laughs) right now. (laughs) Uh, Leads one to testify that he knows the gospel is true, but believes the brethren are just a little out of touch. No, we think they're very out of touch and we don't (laughs) believe the gospel is true. And then the person says... And we can demonstrate it with actual facts. (laughs) Our identity is our faith because we are children of God, followers of Christ who make sacred covenants in his church to one day partake of his greatest gift, eternal life. Yes, everybody else should hold to that. It's fine if they change their beliefs to ours. We just happen to have all the correct opinions, so... (laughs) 
That's nice for us, but (laughs) really think about the truth of Mormonism before you go posting advice on the front page. I know. I'm surprised they didn't do like a, um, I I wonder if there hadn't, if there hadn't have been ex-Mormons in the comments, whether they would have been like, that is good advice for everyone else Uh because they love when people leave their religion to join Mormonism. Uh So surely you can see how it's good advice when applied to anything else that people think is the truest thing of anything on earth when you believe that that they don't know that (laughs) yeah does that count as the suppressive people who leave scientology do they just can't leave scientology alone so i'm like how the the original post i don't think was made by a mormon so it's like why is it a garbage (laughs) garbage idea because it sounds like for what the 99.99 percent of people that are not Mormon, you would think that that was good advice. You it's only because you're making everything about you that you think it's garbage. Because do you really want people in other religions clinging to their beliefs as if they are their identity? Top comment. We are asked to take upon ourselves the name of Christ, the exact opposite of keeping our beliefs and identity separate. Yeah, that's what everyone fucking thinks who believes in Christ. And you think that their way of doing things is absolutely wrong and that their true identity is different from what they think it is because they're actually a child of Mormon God. So again... Can you not at least see how the advice applies to everyone but you in your little paradigm? Someone else, classic Reddit drivel. (laughs) I find it's interesting. We should all be way more entrenched in our beliefs and identities. (laughs) No intellectual humility, no room. I find that being true to oneself is inseparable from embracing God given truth. Yes. Everyone who grows up just being true to themselves and authentic naturally embraces Mormonism. And if what if your true self and your own internal values are different than those of the church, then what's important there? Following your true self or just believing some person who's standing in between you and God? This attitude properly adopted would actually keep so many more people in the church. Yeah. It is that association with identity that is leaving mm-hmm. so, so many people out is because there's like, whoa, I'm a Mormon. And in order to be a Mormon, I have to believe that it was good that a prophet coerced 15 year old girls into marriage. Mm-hmm. I have to believe that God actually uh, thought black people were an inferior race and didn't want them associated with like with us, didn't have a place in the celestial kingdom except for us servants. I have to believe that that was okay. I have to believe that uh, LGBTQ people don't deserve rights in order to be a Mormon. Like, And I have to believe that God wants me to have a yeast infection all the time. <laughs> Someone said, if there's one thing our modern antagonists do very well, it is control the lexicon. Pay very close attention to their editorial decisions. Again, just want to say, this was a post about Mormonism as far as I can... As- Okay, out. this is just exactly what I'm saying about making the whole world uh-huh. is conspiring to target your beliefs specifically. The Mormons. Because just the Mormons do people, have all truths. Two fucking people on the front page post on a Reddit post. So this person said, identity is in practice, this is according to modern according to modern antagonists of the church. Identity is in practice defined as all things you feel which tend away from traditional norms and morality. And false consciousness slash brainwashing as all things you feel which tend towards traditional norms and morality. That's a word salad. But I think he's basically trying to say, trying to claim that when people make statements like that, which is a statement we've made so many times, which is like, don't cling to your beliefs as if they're your identity. They're saying, oh, well, what they actually mean by identity is just things that tend away from traditional norms, uh, aka Mormonism. But it's like the post is really not, it's really just such a general statement. You can't tie it to any one way of thinking. Mm. Like anyone in any ideology, you're right, Mixie. Anyone in any ideology could apply it or not apply it. It's it's just weird the way that it's, what you think that this Reddit front page paste was about you? No, it's (laughs) describing a much larger phenomenon. And again, I just don't understand why the Mormons on Reddit can't see (laughs) that it at least applies to other people. If not themselves, why not other people? Because don't they look at us, for example, and be like, oh, they've just made being ex-Mormon their new identity. So don't you think it'd be good if we didn't cling to our beliefs that Mormonism isn't true as if they were identity? Because then that would make us more flexible to coming back to Mormonism. Why can you not see the wisdom in that post? I just don't get it. Actually, no, changing your opinion is bad. We should cling to it because (laughs) that's what God wants us to do. Got it. I'll stay Catholic then. Next post. Church leadership provides a counterbalance to membership fallibility, not the other way around. This one's interesting. So you know how it kind of felt like maybe for a while they were going more in the direction of like 
prophets speak as men, they're imperfect. But I, I mean, I just did a Mormon stories panel where we responded to, can't remember who he is. He's black and he's the young men's general president, I think. Who, yeah, did the like thing about Corbett, activism. Brother Corbett. Yeah, about activism is bad, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And in that talk, he really doubled down again on like, nope, listen to the leaders no matter what. And I was kind of surprised to see that after it just feels like, again, all their apologetics hinge on not teaching that shit because it's mm. just going to come back to bite them. But anyway, um, this person says, the argument revolving prophetic fallibility is all too exhausting. At this point, it has become pure copium. I don't know what copium means. For those who constantly bring it up to justify not giving themselves fully to Christ, his laws, hmm. and his kingdom. To say that the Lord will move the membership to correct the prophet goes directly against the established order of God and for which scripturally there is no evidence. Oh, excuse me. I seem to forget about the revelation establishing common consent as a necessary <laughs> aspect of church governance. What? I, good thing they did away with that because it sounds very confusing. Also, do memories. you want to talk about things which scripturally there is no evidence for? How about like Joseph Smith <laughs> marrying teenage girls and not having kids with any of them? This person's wanting to say that like, oh, people only claim that the prophets are imperfect just to justify not keeping all the standards of God or whatever. <laughs> right. When, when Joseph Fielding Smith said, we'll never go to the moon, he was absolutely right. Moon landing, hoax. Fake. When Brigham Young said, or oh, actually Joseph Fielding Smith again, <laughs> said that blacks are an inferior race. Black people are an inferior and race. And when like the seven other prophets said that, <laughs> yeah, and like <laughs> 55 apostles <laughs> talked about it in conference. Yeah. But it's like, if you ever try to pin them down on like, okay, so let's take this really racist thing Brigham Young said, was that from God or not? Like they, they try and act like we all, we all just want to doubt the prophet's perfection because we don't want to keep the commandments of God. But then when you try and pin them down on something where it's like, well, it kind of seems like this racism wasn't in line with who, what Christ is telling us to be. So what was the deal there? They, they just won't go there. It's That's some inappropriate intellectualism. Yes. <laughs> It also isn't going to happen for an everyday member to have revealed unto them a better way to direct the saints on any array of contemporary topics. That's interesting because the church sure does seem to change doctrines and the temple ceremony, which was supposed to be eternally unchanging, and other things in response to pressure from members or and public survey pressure. survey responses from members. Yeah, I mean, let's just think of some examples off the top of the head. I mean, the temple ceremony has changed multiple times because in response to a market research survey that the church did. I suppose you could argue that the church initiated the survey, mm -hmm. so maybe not that. They recently took out some, some of the more sexist language in the temple because mm -hmm. they found out that women's issues were a big reason people were leaving the church. They have massively softened their stance on gay people from, you know just literally openly talking shit about them to now it's like a sugar-coated talking shit about mm. them. That's progression. <laughs> They've gone from <coughs> talking about people who leave the church as spreading disease germs, Boyd K. Packer, to now being like, we need to love those of our family, you know? <laughs> like, so many things have changed. They literally changed the fact that black people couldn't have the priesthood because of public <laughs> pressure, which came from outside the church, <laughs> right? Out and in. Like football players refusing to play BYU, the whole tax exempt status being threatened. It shows a severe doubt in an all-powerful God to reveal his will to his specific chosen mouthpieces, and at that point, there is no advantage to having any at all. So close to getting it. <laughs> so close to getting it. Also, this, like, um, it shows severe doubt in God to not just trust everything that this man says is true. <laughs> You're really doubting God when you doubt the arm of the flesh. Lean on that fleshy arm. That's how you trust in God. If you have any doubt that God couldn't remove the prophet from his place or diverge from one next in line, there are more troubling, shelf-breaking issues to prioritize. <laughs> I, that is one of my favorite little uh, things. Like, if the prophet att attempts to lead the church astray, they'll be removed from their place. And it's like, okay, most of the prophets have lived well into their 80s and then died of natural causes. How did Joseph Smith, the founder, die again? Oh, yeah, he was mobbed violently in a jail after he burned down a printing press that was telling the truth about his extramarital affairs. Interesting. What would God removing a prophet look like? <laughs> right. I'm curious. Also, again, they'll say that the Brigham Young's racist shit that he said or saying that interracial marriage is and always would be an eternal sin or like Adam God theory or blood atonement or any number of things was 
that, like their apologetics is that they were speaking as a man, but it's like, well, isn't that leading the church astray? Like, isn't how is racism not leading the church <laughs> astray? Like, how is the exaltation of black people or it's just like always so heinous to me how it, like black people, for example, are just seen as like acceptable collateral damage. God's not too concerned about them. You can just like have all of them banned from the temple and from you know being able to have any power or get sealed to their families and that's fine that doesn't count as leading the church away because it's only black people like that's the energy that it has they're gonna get all the blessings in the hereafter along with the other 99.99 percent of god's children who have lived and breathed on the earth which kind of makes you wonder why the whole thing is necessary to begin with if most of the people are just going to do it after they die but mm. that is just some again inappropriate intellectualism jesus christ does a better job sustaining his prophets than we often do Prophets are fallible, but you and me are more than likely more fallible. I've never said the shit that Brigham Young said. Never pled for segregation, ever. <laughs> never married a kid. I mean, that's going to be like a massive amount of points, surely. Again, it's just like so minimizing. Sorry, I'm muffing about. It's so minimizing of what the actual issues are. And it's hard to believe they even know what they are. If they think it's like, well, members are way more fallible. Like So often, prophets are not... You know, we like to believe that they're better than us and better than our contemporaries, when in fact, usually they're worse than mm -hmm. their contemporaries. Mm -hmm. Look at Brigham Young, Joseph Smith, etc. Mary, everyone, marrying children was totally fine back then. It's like actually not. Fucking uh, what is it? Uh, is it Pride and Prejudice? What is the book that uh, was written before the Book of Mormon? And the villain of the story is someone who is preying on a much, much, much younger woman. And that was seen as like, see, this is bad. That was so before the Book of Mormon. Data. Also, census data saying that that's just simply not true. Wasn't not happening. only was the prophet not as good as, mm -hmm. you know, not better than people actually worse and he like conned them all out of their life savings because he like got a prophecy about a bank and so much stuff again we've never done anything like that <laughs> but it's just this idea that you're supposed to just feel like you're such a piece of shit <laughs> that these people who have objectively done terrible things you're somehow worse just for reasons okay so you know how nelson has his pet things and one of them was that the name mormon is a gift to Satan. Yeah. And his other thing that he's apparently been <laughs> which about, uh, again, former prophets, very mm -hmm. evil, chalking up W's mm -hmm. for Satan all mm -hmm. the time. Because <laughs> Nelson believed this while the I'm a Mormon <laughs> campaign was going on. He was uh, fucking fuming. <laughs> Another thing he's been on for decades is the idea that God's love is actually conditional. Which, isn't it? Wouldn't you say it's doctrinal in Mormon? I mean, if anything can be considered a doctrine, isn't the fact that God's love is unconditional a doctrine? <laughs> I, I don't know, but I know that the Bible says God is love, so what you're saying is God's existence is conditional. <laughs> yes, and I love that you bring that up because it just shows how juvenile a lot of the thinking is because it's like love is something that God like gives or takes or it's like a thing that you have. Mm. It's like as opposed to like a, a state that God is apparent according to the Bible it just exists in eternally. Mm. Everything he does is in love. So what does that mean? Again, I just feel like this this perspective is just like a more juvenile understanding of the idea that God is... I'm not saying the Bible rocks, but I'm just saying like <laughs> God is love as a concept makes sense to me uh -huh. and feels a lot more advanced spiritually than like, you know, God loves you more. Sometimes you, he loves you, sometimes you he hates you. This person says, This banger of a talk is almost 20 years old and it made quite the splash when given. President, then Elder Russell M. Nelson, gave a conference talk on the divine love of God that can be defined as perfect, infinite, enduring, and universal, but it cannot be correctly characterized as unconditional. He said, why is divine love conditional? Because God loves us and wants, to be wants us to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> why is the love conditional? Because he loves us. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> why do I punish you? Because I love you, babe. Okay, I happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it i love when people quote joseph smith's letter to nancy rigdon <laughs> trying happiness to coerce her into lesson. yeah <laughs> 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 trying to coerce nancy rigdon into a marriage she did not want to be in and she turned down his advances that's where we get happiness is the object and design of our existence so i was just joseph trying to get a kid to marry <laughs> it's fine <laughs> Understanding that divine love and blessings are not truly unconditional can defend us against common fallacies such as this. 
since God's love is unconditional, he will love me regardless, or since God is love, he will love me unconditionally regardless. These arguments are used by antichrists to woo people with deception. This is so fucked up because I would say like any good parent on earth, you love your kid regardless. Like Mm -hmm. even if they did something terrible, it doesn't make you stop loving them. You might be disappointed in them. You might even need to like not have contact with them. But like, I feel like most parents that like really, really love their parents know that that love is unconditional. Like they could go to prison and you'd still love them or, you know, they could do horrible things. And it's like, because love, just to like call love conditional just feels so... Um, Antithetical to what love actually yeah. is. Yeah, because love, it's not, it's not something that you give and take away based on like the way people act. That's the opposite of what love is. Mm. That, like it's, that's approval. That's not the same thing as love. Mm. Love is like, you've, maybe you've done terrible things, but I still care about you so deeply and want the best for you. It's not something that can go away because you've done horrible things. Like what, what fucked up version of love is that? That makes me think that Russell M. Nelson hasn't experienced much true love in his life, if that's the oh, way he Oh, absolutely sees it. not. He, I, I mean, in as much as Christ is supposed to represent the archetype of love embodied, this seems like actual anti-Christ yeah. messaging. Like, parents, tell, tell us in the comments, if your kid does something bad... Does it make you not love them? It's like I'm gonna. I don't actually love you until you clean your room. Again, just the. I, I guess it's just the idea that you have to earn love, which is like the ultimate childhood wound <laughs> schema, isn't yeah. it? Like if I can just do things right, then I'll then get the love that I've love always me. needed. Yeah. And if I'm not feeling the love I need, it's because I'm not doing things wrong, right? Because it's too scary to acknowledge that maybe our parents just can't give us the love that we need. Which is why I'm experiencing <clears throat> depression and because of my disobedience and my unwillingness to keep getting a UTI for wearing garments. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It just feels a bit uh, sad that the prophet of the LDS church thinks that love is a conditional thing when us common peasants who are just like <laughs> nobodies, like I feel like I can, f- st- you know, if I, if I get myself into the right state, maybe it's not always like right there. But I can feel love for people who do bad things because mm. there's a bigger picture at play always. Mm. And it's like... An understanding of human nature and the way that we react and respond to things that have happened to us and the things that have been instilled yeah. in us. And yeah, and how much we're all, we can all generally only love to the level that we've been loved. And if we can love better than that, it's usually because we've learned how to love ourselves in the ways we weren't loved. And so then that you know, we can evolve love it love wise, but not, not Russell. Hard to imagine that the leader base, <laughs> the leader of a system based in shame and guilt mongering <laughs> could say a thing like this. That's literally Christ's main thing was like, he loved the sinner, mm-hmm. loved the sinner. <laughs> and this is him saying, God doesn't, well, he says, does this mean the Lord does not love the sinner? Oh, of course not. Divine love is infinite and universal. So then what does that mean? I just feel like you want to have your cake and eat it too. Mm. You basically just want to have like a meaner argument (laughs) because you don't want people who do things you disagree with to feel like they're loved by God. Because no, God's super special love has to be earned and only you have earned it. And Mm. when your brother fucks up and your parents give him just as much attention as they give you, you feel slighted. God loves you, but you really turn away from his love when you're born gay. (laughs) When you choose to be born gay. (laughs) I'm trying to understand what the the bridge is between this, well, Nelson and this post saying God doesn't love people regardless, but also divine love is infinite and universal. There's a dark counterpart, anti-love. <laughs> How can you say divine love is infinite and universal, the saviour loves both saints and sinners, if when it's... your point is that <laughs> why is divine love conditional? Because God loves us and wants us to be happy. You're literally disputing, Nelson's disputing himself in the same talk. You say universal, I don't think you're really thinking about what that Absolutely actually not. means. No. <laughs> you know how some things that are universal are actually somewhat conditional, sometimes not present? <laughs> We're comfortable with paradox, but there's a fucking line where it's just like what what is this saying satan's arguments this is back to the original post satan's arguments have still not changed antagonistic users wander often into this sub to preach a life unrestricted and unbound by religion you can free your mind and live your life often this rhetoric is obvious and easily identified it is when it is subtle that we must be aware 
Yep, interesting that they, you know, saying free your mind is a red flag to them. <laughs> free minds? Absolutely not. God's love no, is conditional. Thanks. <laughs> I oh, like my shackles, way. please. <laughs> they call it a brain cell for a reason. <laughs> Supposed to say trapped in it. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted after I, that. I can't it, do it anymore. That one wasn't as fun as some of the TikTok ones. There's not as much funky music and dancing. and No, just sad, sad rhetoric. And Reddit is a specific place, and it's interesting seeing the sort of... Of justifications they have to come up with to survive in that online environment. All right, thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Support us on Patreon if you want to see bonus content from us. Hmm? Also, we have merch and candles and yeah. Listed below. Love you guys. Bye. Bye. Sorry we didn't have a fun, energetic outro. It's just that I'm dead inside. <laughs>